The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, we gather today on this rainy morning, seeking the light. And here in the sanctuary, we find a moment to stop, to rest, to feel its warmth, and be inspired by its glow. We light that candle as a reminder that Christ is with us. God is here. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome. Welcome to week two of Downtown United, where Wilmont and St. Paul's get together. It is my pleasure to be here preaching with you this morning. And a big thank you um, last week to Aaron Hayes, who made the slides, and this week to uh, Monica Pinu, Pinu, and she is helping us out or helped us out this week with the lovely images that will be behind us and the words on slides, which was wonderful. If you feel a call to help with this, I have a couple more weeks where I need somebody to make some slides. So if you can help out, let me know. Fund script. One of the ways that we have been working at raising some support and funds to help keep the uh, church running, those orders are going to be due uh, soon. So if you have an opportunity or need the information for the order sheet, there should be some at the back. Pick it up today. If there's not some there, there's also a link on the website. And our e-news had some information about some deals that were going on. Are there any other announcements? Any celebrations? I got a look. <laughs> Apparently not. Well, we celebrate being here today, and I invite Shirley to come forward and join us from Wilmot. It might need to be turned on. Up at the top, there'd be a little. There you go. Please join me in the response of welcome called worship. God's greatness is wondrous to behold. Everywhere we look, we can see God. From the loftiest mountains to the crashing waters of the sea. God's greatness can be within, written within the human heart. Open our minds, our hearts, and our spirits this day. Let us honor and praise God. And so we pray. Amazing God, you light the world with your presence. We come seeking an experience of you. We seek visions and come desiring dreams. Our wish, our wish is just to catch a glimpse and maybe be touched that we may experience our life regained and regrown. Come, great revealer, and meet us where we are. Grant us faith, grant us purpose, that comes from your grace and wondrous love. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Normally, this is the time where we have a story time. And I need your help today. I need your help today by thinking about something with me. 
those young and those old among us and online. I want you to think about a time when you've hurt yourself. Maybe you broke an arm or skinned your knee. I still have this little mark where I brushed up against a campfire some 30 plus years ago. Sometimes, sometimes the stories we tell in our faith make us think that God made those things happen because of the words that we use in English and the way our brains try to make everything connect. And the larger story that we live with that says we are responsible for ourselves. And the historical story that said bad things are punishment. But I want you to think about that time when you got hurt. I want you to ask yourself, did God really let that happen? I'm going to ask the grown-ups here because there's a whole bunch of them. Do you think God let you get hurt? Put up your hand if you think yes. Put your head if you think no. God made it happen? Did God make you get hurt? No. No, God didn't make you get hurt. I want you to remember that. All of us to remember that. God doesn't make the bad things happen to us. But God is there to help us, to support us. God is there with the amazing parts of our body that were created and woven together that fixes broken bones and burnt skin. God is there calling our hearts to come forward and comfort the person who's crying or hurt. God is there, not causing the bad things, but working, working for good. God is there seeking to show us love and connection. So remember that. Next time you get hurt, next time you need support, God does not send the pain and the sorrow in our lives but God seeks to mend it, often with our help. Let us sing. Let us sing because that one who seeks to hold and mend and fix is the one who has wondrous love. So come, let us sing of that love.
Today's scripture is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 10. I know a person in Christ who was 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such one, I will boast, but on my, on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weaknesses. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, your ways have always puzzled those who look on. Your story involves blessing senior citizens with a newborn, having your fleeing people be stopped dead by a vast sea, and then wandering through a desert for 40 years. It includes the call to prophets like Gideon to go into battle after sending half their army home and sending the world's greatest gift to a young peasant woman and killing that king on a cross. As we reflect on the letter written so long ago to the church at Corinth, Help us to hear a message for our time and place. This we pray. Amen. It is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Or at least that's how modern society seeks to frame life. Only the sur strong survive. Do you remember this? I'm sorry, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. And so much of life seems to be a competition these days. Even buying a house can feel like you're in the Olympics with the level of competition that is around. From an early age, we are bombarded with the North American idea that we need to be strong, to be the richest, fastest, smartest, biggest, bravest, all of the isits that put us over and above others. We are to be the first and the best because these are prized titles which bestow power and authority to control. This thinking is so pervasive that it is even baked into our economic system. The idea that only the strong survive is our, 
is our twist or twisted take on Darwin's theory of evolution that drives so much of what is seen to have had value in our world. Even now, after the world had been brought to a grinding halt, as we start to rebuild, this is the dominant narrative spoken by many of our leaders. The problem with a world that prizes only the best, the brightest, the strongest, is that so many of us are none of these things. And so we struggle and strive and hide our need out of fear of being called weak. We try to make it look like we have it all together for fear that our vulnerability might show and we'll end up being rejected and beaten down. The problem with this is that we pretend to be okay, to hold on to the perceived power and authority that we have, and this is tiring and life draining, as is that struggle to be number one. While Paul is not speaking directly to the situation that we find ourselves in, I feel he has something important to add to our thinking on what it means to be strong and weak. Our reading today comes from a section of the second letter of Corinthians that some scholars have called the fool's speech. In the prelude, preluding text, Paul speaks sarcastically as a fool and criticizes the way that the super apostles have been manipulating the Corinthians with their claims of special authority. These super apostles have been shaming, oppressing, and perhaps even physically abusing the people for their own advantage. And this is the stage that is set for the passage that we read today. In our passage, we see Paul not bragging about his own personal mystical experience of Christ or his success of what has happened in the past. You know that story, that road to Damascus, where he changes from Saul to Paul. And he doesn't go back to the pharisaic ways that he seemed to have before. Because, oh my gosh, he worked hard to be the best to prove that he was deserving when he was called Saul. Instead, what he does is something unexpected in his world and in ours. First, he rejects the traditional paths to power of his day, lineage, mastery through hard work, and special vision or insight. Maybe not just of his day. And he leans into weakness, talking openly about the struggles he has had and what he refers to as the thorn in his side. He says that this thorn reminds him of who actually has the power and to whom the glory and honor go. He sees his weakness not only as a check on his ego, but also as the basis of his testimony as he witnesses to God's grace and God's mercy. Yet just like the word evangelism, vulnerability is a word that most of us tend to avoid. Vulnerability makes us feel, well, vulnerable and uncomfortable. 
It raises all of our feelings of fear and insecurity about ourselves and the world. We squirm at the thought of a spotlight being shown on our warts and our wrinkles. And yet, at the core of our faith story is a story of vulnerability, of God coming to earth as a baby, tiny and at the mercy of those around him. The story of one who, in the sharing of divine love, never backs down, letting flesh be whipped, hands and feet nailed to a cross, whose body, when it could bear no more, died. And through that vulnerability, through that apparent act of weakness, we glimpse salvation. Just like Christ, each mark of weakness in our bodies and souls holds a story of God's grace. And yet so often we would rather hide our truth than allow that powerful story to be told. While we are busy hiding and ignoring our weakness, the reality is God is just waiting right there looking to use it. Use it to connect us to each other. Use it to show divine love. Use it to create a better world and way. If only we'd be vulnerable enough to omit what is there. In the book, Bullseye, Aiming to Follow Jesus, United Church Minister Jamie Holt Holton and Deb Johnson talk about six marks of Christian life. In their book, Mark 3 is authentic community. Authentic community, that place where you can be truly who you are, that place grounded in the love of God that says, I accept you regardless of who and what and where you've been. Authentic community. We want that, don't we? But it can only happen when we follow Paul's lead. When we humble ourselves and speak truth, when we allow ourselves to be seen, to allow God to work within our community, within us. You can't have authentic community without being vulnerable. After all, we're human. We all have our weaknesses. And yet, how often do we actually answer the question, how are you doing? With something other than fine or good. When I was in school, I'd often in the morning ask that question to the people around us, around me, standing in the halls waiting. How are you doing? Oh, good. How are you doing? Fine. How are you doing? My sister died this weekend. It was a moment of stark reality but was also a moment of authentic connection. A moment where somebody could be seen and heard and support offered. How often do we answer, how are you doing? 
with a fine, a good. Instead of with the truth that's going on within us. And maybe that's not a tragic death of a loved one. Maybe it's the fact that my garden is growing so lovely and I have more than enough zucchini. It's amazing. Do you need one? That's an actual statement. If you need a zucchini, it looks like we're going to have a bumper crop. <laughs> or, hey, I'm really struggling with the news and the church's role in our history with First Nations. Or maybe, and this one we're a little bit better at, my grandchild, I'm going to have another grandchild, a great-grandchild. Authentic community, vulnerability, connection, truth, power. So many see that as weakness. Admitting that you can't do something, admitting that you're struggling, admitting that you need help. And that's a shame. Because as researcher Brene Brown has told us and seen in her research, Without vulnerability, there is con not connection. Without connection, we don't experience love. But to be vulnerable, we need to step beyond our shame, our fear, and our discomfort. To move beyond the thought that I am not good enough I might not be wanted. And here again, our faith story helps us. For Christ was vulnerable, and in that vulnerability, clearly said there is nothing that would cause you to be separate from me. In that vulnerability has said, you are good enough that even I would go to death. In that vulnerability, in our weakness, Christ has said, you will not be alone. I am with you. My love surrounds you. Do not fear. Resting in those words. Resting in that message. Listening to the spirit whisper strength within our hearts. we too can embrace our weakness, our limitations, our struggles. And be the community that Christ calls us. I wanna leave us with the words of Paul taken from the message, which is a paraphrase of our Bible. Paul says, now I take limitation in stride and with good cheer. These limits that cut me down to size, abuse, incidences, oppression, bad breaks. I just let Christ take over. And so the weakness I get, the stronger I become. 
May God continue to work in our communities and within ourselves, giving us the strength and courage to face our weakness and to rely and trust that through God's power and love, the way will become clear. Connection will become strong. And we can create authentic community both in these walls and beyond. Amen. Let us join in our hymn, My Soul Cries Out, and may our vulnerability cause the world to turn. I invite you to be seated. Sometimes it feels like we need to do it all, that everything rests on us. But the truth is that when we trust in God, we find what we need. Strength, courage, hope, love. 
When we face the challenges of the world and the church, we cannot fix it all ourselves. But we have been given part of the solution for the world's ills. As stewards of these gifts, we are called to partner with God and each other. Now let us think about what we have been given to share. Holding in our minds those things that we can offer, let us pray our prayer of dedication to God. Loving God, as we commit ourselves to your way, we give thanks that you work with us and through us. Bless the time, talent, and treasure that we offer and empower these gifts through your spirit for the sharing of your love. This is I agree. Amen. And let us continue to pray. Between the week behind us and the week before us, we are burdened and blessed with so much to bring before God, before you, O Holy One. In this moment, let us lay before God all that is on our hearts. Lend to this time and space, O God, your spirit, for we are open to your holy presence. Help us to know that it is not just in times like this and grand spaces like this church where we meet you. Remind us that you are with us in the everyday moments, encouraging us with every step we take. You are there jumping in the moments of joy, embracing us in the moments of sadness, finding us when we are lost. We give thanks for your presence, for the blessing of the whispers of your spirit, for the hand that reaches out at your prodding. We give thanks for family and friends, for the ways that we have found that we're new this year to connect with them, and the familiar ways that are opening up to us again. Encourage us to continue to strengthen all of our relationships, to walk into vulnerability, for that's where we find connection. We give you thanks for the rain this day, for the life that comes through water, for the growth that comes in the cycle of our days. And we thank you for one another in this community of faith, for those who have given so much of themselves to strengthen the community, for the conversations and disagreements and faith that we share, for the ways that these help us to grow, and for all of the support that is offered along the way. We give thanks for those who share our lives, and we also bring before you, O oh God, our deepest prayers of concern. 
those people in places that weigh on our hearts. Hear us as we pray in this moment our prayers of concern. Prayers for our First Nations communities that are grieving. Prayers for all who have been faced with violence. For places of war and uncertainty. For all of the places around the world where climate change seems to be written large with extreme heats and drought. For the communities who face fire and rebuilding and grieving from all forms of natural disasters. You, O Holy One, are with us to listen and to guide as we pray for the world around us. We also pray for ourselves. We pray for the strength to be vulnerable and to be open to each other. We pray that you will give us courage that we need when facing the unknown and the uncertainty. We pray for a portion of your wisdom to know when to speak and when to listen. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray. These are the prayers of your people written on our hearts, raised to you in voice and in the silence. And we bind them up in the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, I want us to take a moment. I'm sure we all have a moment in our lives where we have felt the touch of somebody saying, come and rest and know you're okay. That's a human experience, we've all had it. One of the most powerful for me was about eight months after Reed was born in rural Saskatchewan, pretty isolated, suffering from some postpartum depression and trauma from his birth. I was walking in a local town and this fiery redhead who also had a kid about Reed's age came up to me and said, hi, how are you? I haven't seen you before. I said, well, I'm from down the road. And she invited me 
to her mom's group. A place where for me was the first time in a long time that I had experienced that authentic community. Where we could share and support and uphold each other. The voice of Jesus isn't just something that comes from burning bushes or in a silent nudging in our hearts. It can come from the person sitting next to you. I know we've all been pretty weary this last year. And I know that we see the light of things becoming less wearisome. But we do still need to come and rest and renew and open our hearts. So let us sing. I hear the voice of Jesus say, and be aware of where Jesus is speaking in your own life after you leave this space. Let us sing. Go now, and wherever people will hear you, proclaim the life-changing love of God. Do not fear your weakness, for when you are weak, Christ's strength is known. May God be our protection and safe haven. May the power of Jesus Christ dwell in us, and may the Holy Spirit be our guide forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.